Um, thank you all for joining us. Good afternoon. I'm going to be speaking about respiratory dysfunction after spinal cord injury today. Um, briefly, we're going to be talking about the uh, neurophysiological basis for respiratory care in folks with spinal cord injury. Um, and I'm going to focus a lot on secretion management. That's especially uh, an issue in the acute setting, but um, potentially with, uh, with COVID pneumonias and other types of pneumonias that we're seeing these days. We'll talk through ventilator settings, weaning protocols, and then um, talk about the incidence and management of sleep apnea and spinal cord injury, and uh, finish up with a discussion on diaphragmatic pacing after spinal cord injury. So in 2005, the uh, Paralyzed Veterans of America came out with consortium guidelines for respiratory care and uh, essentially addressed these issues, the initial assessment, prevention and treatment of atelectasis and pneumonia, um, mechanical ventilation settings and weaning protocols, uh, sleep disordered breathing, dysphagia and aspiration, um, as well as psychosocial adjustments and discharge planning. We're gonna focus mostly on the upper portion of these guidelines. Recognize that um, within, uh, within a year, uh, our, our friends to the Great White North uh, up in Canada had put together the uh, spinal cord injury rehabilitation evidence uh, discussion on pulmonary care as well, and, and pretty much addressed the same issues. Um, so I wanna start off with a discussion of the muscles of respiration. This is supposed to be inspirational, but um, <clears throat> it'll be expirational as well. Um, recognize that uh, when we think about the muscles of respiration, primary muscles include the diaphragm, innervated by C3, 4, and 5, and the internal intercostal muscles, innervated by T1 through T11. Um, accessory inspiratory muscles include the sternocleidomastoid, trapezius, and scalenes. If you see somebody using these muscles, um, basically they are uh, just minutes away from going into uh, complete pulmonary uh, failure, pulmonary distress. Um, now, the muscles of expiration are primarily passive uh, in that uh, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, as they relax uh, passively, we have a certain amount of expiration with that. But if you want to generate pressure, um, and why would we do that, particularly for a cough to clear mucus secretions, then we're going to um, activate as well the uh, rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis, and internal external obliques. Uh, so re recognize again, and going all the way back to the fourth grade, you remember your science teacher talking with, with a, a vacuum bell jar, and he had two balloons sitting inside and they were completely empty. And then he did a vacuum um, to the bell jar, the atmospheric pressure surrounding those balloons decreased and they subsequently inflated. This is a lot of what we uh, need to consider as we're thinking about respiratory mechanics in that it's contraction of the diaphragm and elevation of the ribs through the intercostal muscles that generate a vacuum and subsequently allow for the lungs to feel. The lungs themselves obviously are not muscles. And so the muscles surrounding the lungs create a negative atmosphere that uh, subsequently uh, we, we refer to as inspiration and subsequently expiration as we go through there. One of the important things to remember up front is the purpose of our abdominal muscles. So under normal circumstances, your abdominal muscles are holding your abdominal contents in and up against the diaphragm, such that when you contract your diaphragm, it actually generates a fairly nice tidal volume. Um, however, if you have abdominal muscle paralysis, the abdominal contents are gonna be sitting down and out. And in that scenario, when you go to contract the diaphragm, simply because it's resting length was uh, so different, you're gonna see very little in the way of a tidal volume. Luckily, we, we have at, um, at our uh, fingertips, basically a, a very expensive and, and uh, miraculously engineered device called an abdominal binder. And when we put that abdominal binder on appropriately, it's going to squeeze the abdominal contents in and up against the diaphragm, restoring the resting length of the diaphragm and subsequently restoring the tidal volume. So if you haven't figured this out before, I really, really am an advocate for the use of our abdominal binders. Um, they're absolutely essential to overcome the restrictive 
lung disease that is neurogenic after a spinal cord injury. So um, what are other components or other aspects of restrict restrictive lung disease? Basically, uh, folks are gonna have a low vital capacity, reduced total lung capacity and shallow breathing. That is a typically a reduced tidal volume and tachypnea in response uh, to compensate for that. That is rapid respiratory rate because the tidal volume is low. Pulmonary compliance is diminished, meaning that it's more difficult to overcome the elasticity of uh, basically the thorax uh, so that the elastic work of breathing is actually increased. Other examples you're familiar with include uh, neurogenic scoliosis, obesity, obstructive apnea, muscular dystrophies, and uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So, so let's step back 30,000 foot perspective again, just recognizing central nervous system comprised of a brain and cord. Um, and the cord, depending upon the level of a spinal cord injury will provide uh, uh, neural influence uh, to the following muscle groups. Uh, C3, 4, 5, as we talked about before, keeps the diaphragm alive. So if your injury is at C3 or above, the chances of being able to voluntarily maintain appropriate respiration or ventilation are gonna be markedly diminished. Um, so we'll talk through the aspects of the somatic nervous system in a moment. Don't forget, however, the role that the autonomic nervous system plays, uh, particularly that tug of war that is constant between the sympathetic nervous system um, and the parasympathetic nervous system. So as a reminder, the sympathetic nervous system conveys fight or flight, that is ergotropic responses. Um, and so in those scenarios, from a respiratory standpoint, we would expect to see under sympathetic influence, bronchodilation and a reduction in mucus secretion uh, during that time of crisis. The parasympathetic nervous system, uh, typically in opposition to the sympathetic nervous system, conveys energy conservation. So a trophotropic uh, influence, um, which essentially pays back the uh, utilization of substrates, et cetera, that were utilized during a crisis situation. So under times of plenty, the parasympathetic nervous system is going to try to replenish uh, substrates that have been utilized during that time and prepare the body for its next crisis uh, situation. With regards to the pulmonary system, uh, we see that primarily in bronchoconstriction and mucus secretion uh, during times when we have the luxury of being able to clear secretions and whatnot. We're not running from the saber-toothed tiger or, or, or whoever you would be running from uh, in that uh, crisis situation. So we talked about a neurogenic restrictive lung disease. Spinal cord injury also actually causes a neurogenic obstructive lung disease, was not there before. So because of the spinal cord injury, and particularly because of the parasympathetic dominance, we end up with, um, at all times, a relative bronchiolar constriction, mucus secretion, and unopposed obstructive lung disease. So that being the case, we have to recognize this in advance. And ideally, I want to get pulmonary function tests on our folks as soon as possible. Usually it's not possible in the uh, acute rehabilitation setting, but immediately afterwards, when I see folks in my clinic the first time, I'm gonna send them for pulmonary function tests among other things. Um, so why is this so important? Um, mucus uh, is part of the parasympathetic uh, nervous system activ uh, activation. Um, remember that mucus is this colloidal suspension of water, DNA, glycoproteins, proteoglycans, it's sticky. And mucus grabs hold of infectious organisms, dust particles, et cetera, uh, that would otherwise cause damage to the interstitium of, of the lungs. And the mucus then is, um, is holding on to those foreign objects, if you will, and cleared through a, uh, a robust cough where we clear our secretions. And it works great unless you're a person with neuromuscular disease or spinal cord injury who can't generate enough pressure to clear those secretions, in which case the secretions just dry up you develop mucus plugging uh, and, and subsequently die of respiratory distress, which is suboptimal, yes. So um, 
we recognize this even in our patients. And I had recently admitted a, a patient to Dr. DeLal's service who we encouraged. We, we said we need duo nebs, we need postural percussion and drainage, and we need mechanical inexufflation all within 30 minutes of each other at least four times a day. And after 24 hours with, um, unfortunately, these orders uh, not followed, <clears throat> our uh, patient developed mucus plugging and was subsequently uh, transferred back to the ICU where he spent another week and a half uh, trying to get him back to the baseline when he had come over to us. So this is so absolutely important that we manage this. Um, and, and as much as possible, we want to prevent uh, the uh, need for bronchoscopy. I don't know if any of you have ever had bronchoscopy before. It's an incredibly um, intense, agonizing experience. It tickles the bronchi all the way down um, as they're trying to clear the mucus plug that is down there. Um, and uh, it, uh, it creates tremendous anxiety. Not only can you not breathe uh, during the procedure, but uh, the, the, the um, absolute distress associated with not being able to cough after a spinal cord injury is, is almost unbelievable. And so respiratory management early on in spinal cord injury, providing deep uh, tracheal suctioning obviously uh, is important, providing bronchodilators, um, and this is gonna include um, typically uh, ipotropium bromide as well as albuterol treatment, so duo nebs, um, and then uh, mucolytic agents, ideally nebulized sodium bicarbonate, um, although you can't get your hands on it these days. Um, it's just not available. Um, and so um, mucomus can be helpful, but is bronchospastic. Uh, remember that mucomus and, a needle, and and acetylcysteine is used for a completely different purpose for most of you uh, as you came across it. Um, and so I'm gonna try to coach you through how to manage um, the secretions uh, following spinal cord injury when you don't even have uh, mucomus uh, available. Um, in exsufflation, uh, ex, in exsufflation, insufflation, exsufflation um, is preferred to bronchoscopy. It is a, a preventive measure that we're going to talk through a little bit more detail. So we know that our folks with uh, high spinal cord injury, but as well even paraplegia, uh, develop significant parasympathetic dominance and airway hyperreactivity. Um, there have been a number of studies out there before the turn of the century, and since that time, we recognize more and more importantly the need for bronchodilators um, as, as well as these agents to uh, basically try to reduce the spasticity, uh, if, if you will, the, the hyperreactivity of the upper airways as we go through this. So managing uh, by opening up the bronchioles by um, doing duo nebs, uh, nebulizers actually moisten secretions we can then shake those secretions loose with oscillation devices or postural percussion and drainage. Um, and then it's very important then to clear those with mechanical and exsufflation. Um, so what does that look like? That's assisted deep breathing um, uh, where instead of doing an abdominal thrust with exhalation, we used to call that quad coughing, uh, became more and more contraindicated as we saw more and more inferior vena cable filters placed in our folks. When you do a quad cough, which is like a Heimlich maneuver, if you will, uh, a quad cough on our folks who have an inferior vena cable filter, that filter can migrate and uh, subsequently even um, pierce through the inferior vena cava leading to exsanguination and death, which is suboptimal. So um, it's inappropriate to do quad coughing, uh, particularly when you have inferior vena cable filters in place. So what do we do instead? We use uh, assisted deep breathing, mechanical inexsufflation, um, and uh, also known as cough assist. How cough assist works? Cough assist simulates a cough through mechanical inexsufflation of the airway vessels and Cycles 
So typically we would use uh, six to 10, and I would say 10 uh, of these cycles each time that we do the mechanical and exsufflation. Uh, we start off with using uh, 20 positive and 20 negative tour. Um, I would encourage those of you who have not experienced the mechanical and exsufflation to actually trial it on yourself so you know what it feels like. Um, and um, when we first do it, 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 it's somewhat uncomfortable for our patients. Ultimately, we're going to wean up to 40 tor inspiratory pressure, 40 tor expiratory pressure to help clear these secretions. Um, it's contraindicated for folks who have had a recent pneumothorax, but in most cases, it's the preferred method for clearing secretions. And so what I really want you to do is when you're writing your orders on our folks with spinal cord injury, high spinal cord injury, to make sure that the orders look like this. You've got a, a nebulizer treatment with dual nebs, um, and uh, that's going to essentially moisten secretion and, and open the airways, um, followed immediately by postural percussion and drainage and or vibration uh, to shake those secretions loose, and then mechanical inexsufflation, titrated up from 2020 to 4040 as tolerated, and again, it's important to get this all done within 30 minutes so the secretions are still moist. Otherwise, you can use this, um, but this protocol will still result in uh, mucus plugging if you allow too much time in between these. So this is our, our preferred method for managing uh, secretions in spinal cord injury. I want to take uh, a little bit of time and talk through ventilator modes so our folks um, Certainly with injuries, C3 and above are going to um, be on a ventilator, but many of our folks with C4 and even C5 spinal cord injury will initially be on a mechanical ventilator. Um, and um, my, my hope is that uh, when folks come to us on vents or if we see them in the ICU setting, that they are on assist controlled ventilation rather than synchronous intermittent mandatory ventilation. Um, there are a number of, of reasons for this, not the least of which it allows us to do a progressive ventilator free weaning protocol that is much more effective um, than uh, when we use synchronous inter intermittent mandatory ventilation that never allows us uh, complete uh, rest and recovery after a spinal cord injury. So the, um, the advantages are listed here for assist control, allowing alternate periods of work and rest, uh, and therefore better strengthening and endurance training for these folks. Uh, this allows us to use a T-piece as we go through this process, um, basically uh, switching them onto the T-piece and allowing them to breathe on their own. Um, remember that while they're on mechanical ventilation, um, the diaphragm is not contracting at all. And so uh, the diaphragm is going to atrophy even much quicker then you put a limb in a cast, for example, an upper extremity, the muscles in that upper extremity that um, are casted are going to atrophy very quickly. Recognize that when we have somebody on mechanical ventilation, you see a similar, very, very rapid um, atrophy of the diaphragm. Um, now, the, uh, the problem with IS, uh, SIMV mode is that it is going to significantly prolong the weaning process uh, you don't get this uh, uh, rest period, uh, and subsequently you don't get an opportunity to fully take advantage of uh, anabolism as you're going through. So common problems with uh, respiratory treatment uh, in spinal cord injury, the most common complications are at atelectasis and pneumonia as they fail to uh, completely expand those alveoli. Uh, subsequently, they are at high risk for developing pneumonia um, as uh, they're, they're uh, uh, basically the alveoli are not completely uh, filling. Those that are filling, um, if they're not filling completely, are going to be at high risk for holding on to uh, bacteria in the area. Um, we also know that acute uh, indications for ventilator management uh, are for those who can't manage their secretions appropriately. Those who have impending fatigue, that is you're seeing uh, the use of those accessory muscles of inspiration, particularly sternocleidomastoid, trapezius, and scalenes. Um, unresponsive hypoxemia, a respiratory rate greater than 35 despite the use of an abdominal binder. A maximal inspiratory pressure and maximal expiratory pressure of uh, 25 or 20 tor, respectively. 
or a vital capacity that, that is less than two times their predicted tidal volumes. So when we put somebody on a ventilator who has a spinal cord injury, that is a neurogenic um, respiratory dysfunction, the settings are gonna be different than you're gonna use with an able-bodied individual um, in that I'm uh, recommending tidal volumes uh, set at 15 to 20 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, but the, the, the pulmonary physicians are, are going to wrinkle their foreheads, uh, arch an eyebrow and actually vehemently uh, tell you that you're about to put the patient into ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, but I'm gonna explain why that's not the case in spinal cord injury. And then we're gonna maintain a peep of one to two centimeters of water just to, to make sure that we keep the alveoli open and they, they don't collapse. So Peterson, uh, way back before the turn of the century out of Craig Hospital, basically did high versus low tidal volumes for folks with uh, C4 spinal cord injury, C3 and C4. And uh, generally what they found is those who were on high tidal volumes were able to wean almost twice as fast in just over a month compared to two months for those who had low tidal volumes. Um, certainly their peak pressures were higher. And uh, again, our, our pulmonary colleagues are wincing because they, they hate to see a peak pressure of 40 or approaching 40. Um, and yet only 16% of these folks developed atelectasis. Only two of them developed pneumonia and none of them developed, excuse me, none of them developed acute respiratory distress syndrome. As opposed to those who were on low tidal volumes, uh, their peak pressures uh, just below 30 centimeters of water. Over half of them developed atelectasis, six of them developed pneumonias, and one of them developed acute respiratory distress syndrome. So what, what's the deal with acute respiratory distress? Um, those of you who have seen the whiteout, you know what that looks like and the mortality that goes along with it is significant, 50% or more. Um, but what is acute respiratory distress syndrome? Essentially, it is parenchymal damage that diminishes the ability to exchange gases. And like I said, carries a very, very high mortality with it. Um, in 2000, uh, Ware and Mathe reported in New England Journal of Medicine uh, that a high tidal volume seemed to be implicated in acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is for folks who are neurologically intact. Um, and that's an important uh, uh, finding here, although they didn't report this out, they didn't look at anybody who had neurogenic um, obstructive or restricted lung disease. And, and essentially what they reported at the time and is, has been demonstrated since then is that volume trauma um, is, uh, is actually causing alveolar damage, increasing the um, uh, cytokines and inflammatory cells associated with this and subsequently leading to this uh, parenchymal uh, lung disease. Callet, however, reported in 2006 um, and it was uh, fairly controversial at the time uh, that the work of breathing was inversely proportional to tidal, vo uh, tidal volumes in non-spinal cord injury adults. What, is, what does that mean? If, um, if you increase the tidal volume, uh, you continue to expand the alveoli. Alveolar expansion is necessary to secrete uh, from uh, these alveoli uh, to secrete what, what is that, uh, that item that we use in neonates and whatnot? We're worried if they don't have it, their breathing won't go well. Um, basically, surfactant. So surfactant um, is only produced when you are fully expanding the alveoli. And when you don't uh, fully expand them, then you decrease uh, the uh, elasticity, of the, if you will, of the alveoli. And it increases the work of breathing. So um, again, uh, Peterson's group uh, uh, subsequently stayed on and made recommendations for one of the model systems uh, protocols. Um, and the group at Craig Hospital, again, uh, compared high versus uh, relatively low tidal volumes uh, to wean ventilator uh, from individuals with subacute spinal cord injury. Um, they powered this on a sample size of 70. And unfortunately, they should have increased the sample size. Um, so the bottom line is they didn't show a difference in the median days to wean. About 
14 and a half days in uh, group one versus 14 days in group two. Um, what they did show was that there was no significant uh, morbidity mortality associated with the high tidal volumes, however. Um, now, recently, um, oh, just a few months ago, a uh, tier uh, group of physicians reported out high tidal volumes um, and uh, pneumonias associated with acute spinal cord injury. And, uh, and it's important to recognize that uh, basically of 181 patients they were looking at, um, almost half developed uh, ventilator associated pneumonias. Um, and this wasn't a perfectly randomized trial uh, in that they had a significantly higher number of folks assigned to the high, uh, I'm sorry, a higher number of individuals assigned to the low tidal volume group or the standardized tidal volume group as opposed to the high tidal volume group. Um, and basically what they found here was that the uh, folks with complete spinal cord injury um, seemed to have uh, more pneumonias than those with low tidal volumes. However, there were a number of problems associated with this. They didn't describe their secretion management uh, strategy, uh, which should have included duo NABs, postural percussion and drainage, and mechanical and exsufflation. Um, and, uh, and this is a study that really needs to be uh, a randomly controlled trial. And I think that they are actually uh, reaching out to multi-sites, including our site, to consider a multi-site trial looking at ventilator weaning protocols. So the bottom line is, at least from early work, uh, it appears that higher tidal volumes are going to reduce atelectasis and the time to wean. They're gonna reduce the episodes of pneumonia, pleural effusion, empyemas, trap lung and decortications, but they may increase the number of uh, pneumothoraces uh, associated with this. Um, the consortium guidelines talk about vent weaning and they do in fact promote higher tidal volumes. Um, and so uh, essentially what we're gonna do is look at tidal volumes between 15 and 20 cc's per kilo. Um, and if this is low, uh, so let's say for example, the folks in the ICU are reluctant to increase the tidal volumes and they send somebody to us. Now we're not taking vent patients just yet, but we will. Uh, within the next six to 12 months is my hope. Um, we would subsequently increase the tidal volumes by 100 cc a day until we achieve uh, the goal. Um, that would be at 15 to 20 cc's per kilo of ideal body weight. Um, basically, we also have to minimize the dead space as we're going through this, maintain the peak pressures less than 40 centimeters of water, um, and keep the tidal volumes below 25 cc's per kilo. Um, Basically, uh, these are the guidelines. I would anticipate us following these in addition to using the secretion management strategies that I talked about earlier. So what does ventilator weaning look like? First off, I'll say that most folks with a C4 spinal cord injury who don't have pre-existing parenchymal lung damage should be able to wean off a ventilator. And most of these folks would be able to breathe independently uh, assuming that we were managing them appropriately, that we provided um, abdominal binders to optimize the uh, breathing mechanics of the diaphragm, et cetera. But if you've got at least C3 and C4 working, most folks would be able to wean off of a mechanical ventilator. The weaning checklist looks like this. Min uh, maximal inspiratory pressure should be greater than 20, as should maximal expiratory pressure. Um, respiratory rate should be less than 30 and the min minute ventilation should be uh, less than 10 liters, but ideally be able to double that uh, uh, voluntarily. Um, we need to optimize nutrition status, minimize secretions, make sure that they didn't have infections and make sure they had a good mental status and were willing, oh yes, make sure that they're willing to wean off the ventilator. Um, so what does that look like? Um, Again, uh, most of the time in the ICUs, uh, when they go to wean somebody, they sit them upright. Um, and that's okay if you're neurologically intact and, and your abdominal muscles can hold your abdominal contents in and up the diaphragm. But if you have abdominal muscle paralysis, as with our spinal cord injury folks, when they go to sit you up, your diaphragm drops so that the resting length is markedly changed. 
and you're only going to be able to generate a very, very small, small tidal volume. So use an abdominal binder and or have the person try to wean supine. Um, and again, using assist control so that we can use uh, progressive ventilator free breathing, um, we're, uh, we're able to achieve success in about two thirds of our folks, as opposed to using the SIMD modes, um, which uh, usually doesn't go as well. Uh, only about a third of those folks at a similar level of spinal cord injury um, are able to wean. Poor prognostic indicators, those with a uh, level of spinal cord injury above C4, over the age of 50, a vital capacity less than one liter and, and associated injuries. Um, so the ventilator weaning should look like this. And this is the other thing that often happens in the um, ICU that we should be uh, consulting and, and helping to guide them with. Um, our folks, again, have a diaphragm that is almost paper thin uh, after being on a mechanical ventilator for three to four months. They don't have the anabolic uh, hormones to optimize diaphragmatic hypertrophy, for example. And so if we can get two minutes three times a day for the first couple of days, that is a success. Oftentimes what happens in the ICU, and, and some of you have been there recently, you know they're trying to get people off an hour, two hours, three hours on, on day one or day two. And for our folks, that's, that's too great a change. Um, because uh, we've got a neurogenic restrictive and obstructive lung disease now that we're having to overcome. So this is the wean schedule that we would promote. Um, you could, if a person is doing really well and say that they did 10 minutes three times a day, I could potentially jump to 30 minutes three times a day, but I don't wanna make more than two, uh, two step jumps um, as I go through this. Um, so the bottom line is, those who are eligible would be who had a clear chest X-ray and agreed to wean. Um, those uh, whose pulse ox is acceptable, um, you have already worked on uh, bringing the trach cuff down and they're able to tolerate trach talk with a passing muir valve. Um, once you get down to this final step and they're able to go 24 hours without the ventilator, I keep the ventilator in the room for the next couple of days, just in case. Um, and then, uh, then we go ahead and wean them off completely. When would I discontinue a wean protocol? If the person is having difficulty with a rapid respiratory rate, um, if their heart rate um, is increasing significantly and or their blood pressure changes significantly, either up or down, um, if they're not able to maintain oxygen associated with that before we start to move forward again. Okay, when they're on a ventilator, most of them are going to have a trach. Um, and uh, the indications for putting in the trach are se severe mouth or neck injuries, risk of aspiration, and prolonged mechanical ventilation. Um, so oftentimes we will get um, consulted on these folks after a trach has been placed. Uh, the person is already on mechanical uh, ventilation. Um, typically, they will have a cuffed trach. Um, and what we need to start advocating for is to go to a cuffless uh, system. Um, why would we do that? Um, basically, we want to restore the natural peep. The cuff oftentimes is there to what? Prevent aspiration. Um, and so you end up with food particles, et cetera, et cetera, sitting on top of the balloon. So the next time you let the balloon down, those food particles are still there and they're still going to drop. So we're kind of fooling ourselves um, into thinking that we're keeping this person safe by using a cuffed trait. Um, but as soon as possible, I want to be able to move to a cuffless system. Um, and so that, that means demonstrating the person is going to be safe with the cuff down uh, for at least a day or two. Um, and then starting to use a passing Muir valve uh, as we go through this process. Now, there's a great uh, website talking about the passing Muir valve. This is a one-way valve that allows the person to inspire through the trach, but as they exhale, basically the, uh, the valve closes and the air goes upwards through the vocal folds and allows them to speak in between breaths as they are taking deep breaths from the ventilator. 
<clears throat> so this is uh, an important part of communication strategy as well. The other thing that many folks will tell you, they've been in the ICU for days or weeks, they can't communicate and it's so frustrating for them. And so as soon as possible, we want to get them to a cuffless system and start using a passing muir valve so they can vocalize um, as they go through this. Now, why doesn't a person um, tolerate using a passing muir valve? One of the things that we also need to consider is we are changing uh, the pressures now. As, as we uh, basically go to a cuffless system, we need to increase tidal volumes by one to 200 cc's simply to accommodate for the blow-by now that is going through um, uh, as we no longer have that uh, cuff in place. And if you don't do that, yes, they're gonna to start to feel anxious because they're not feeling like they're getting fully expanded the way they did before you let the cuff down. So that's gonna be an important part of this uh, to compensate for the leakage when you put the cuff down, uh, make sure that you increase the tidal volume somewhere between one to 400 cc's as you go through there. So cuff deflation, and ultimately what we're looking towards is uh, being able to wean them from the ventilator and ultimately um, decannulation. So uh, decannulation for spinal cord injury, we get them off the vent um, and there's still concern about their, their aspiration. Um, recognize that Ross and White and Bach um, have reported, Bach actually uh, much more recently, just uh, two months ago, uh, reported out um, the, the benefits of decannulation following spinal cord injury. And uh, one of the key things here is to, again, restore the natural peep as we're going through the process and allow for uh, vocalization and, um, and essentially getting back to normal for these folks. Um, the concern was, and Ross and White addressed this, so did Bach in 2006, um, that the trach itself can sometimes contribute to uh, increasing risk for aspiration. And so removal of the trach and, um, and when you do this, uh, there is a protocol that we need to establish, basically uh, making sure that we have a spare trach and trach dilator at the bedside, um, getting uh, sign on with the speech pathologist, ENT if necessary, and our nursing staff so that everybody's on board. And we're not gonna do this at four o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. We're, we're gonna ideally do this at eight o'clock in the morning on Monday. Um, after you've had a weekend of success, the person has had the uh, trach capped, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then you move forward with decannulation. So this is the, uh, the protocol that I would typically follow um, and to make sure that the person um, obviously doesn't have any uh, significant pulmonary secretions, that they don't have an infection, their x-ray is clear, um, and there's no aspiration. So Again, the decannulation protocol on the right side here is something that I've uh, employed over the past uh, 20 years at different institutions. Um, I would like us to be using this here as well. And again, why decannulate? To reduce the risk of infections, tracheal injury, sputum plugs, dysphagia, and impaired communication. So positive pressure. Um, <clears throat> This is Rodan's The Thinker um, on BiPAP. Uh, why on BiPAP? To maintain his thinking ability, his mentation, uh, basically. Um, because those uh, folks who are developing sleep apnea at night become hypoxic and lose brain cells uh, over time. So um, continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP, maintains the airway's patency uh, during sleep. Whereas BiPAP also does that, but allows for adjustment of both the inspiratory and the expiratory positive airway pressure, uh, providing better inspiratory muscle support. So sleep apnea, uh, this is uh, the cessation of breathing while asleep, suboptimal. Uh, this is where you have a closure of both oral and nasal airways, uh, and the symptoms include irregular breathing and snoring, daytime sleepiness, memory or concentration problems, waking up often uh, during the night, particularly anxious, and then waking up tired or with a headache. Now, when a, a person with a spinal cord injury reports to you a morning headache, what is your first thought and concern? Because it could kill them. Yes, autonomic dysreflexia, okay? So first make sure that they're not having autonomic dysreflexia. You check, bladder's good, bowel's good. Oh, their heart rate and blood pressure is okay. So 
the headache is probably not, in this case, attributed to autonomic dysreflexia. What's the next most likely thing? Sleep apnea, um, actually. And so doing appropriate studies as we go through there, recognizing that sleep apnea means that you're going to become hypoxic, your brain isn't going to get sufficient oxygen, and therefore you're gonna end up losing brain cells uh, over a period of time. There are a number of studies showing sleep apnea and spinal cord injury, and surprisingly, not just tetraplegia, but even those with paraplegia, and why would that be? Because they have a concomitant obesity, and the obesity also contributes to um, sleep apnea. So paralyzed abdominal musculature and obesity um, put people at uh, high, high risk, those with spinal cord injury for developing sleep apnea. So we're going to do a sleep study, and then they're gonna put this, this mask <clears throat> that is on the left side of the screen here um, on the person's face. They're gonna tighten it down with an elastic strap that pulls it tightly, tightly to maintain positive airway pressure. And as they do that, they develop a pressure injury across the bridge of the nose and the person never wants to use this again. Thank you very much. Um, I would rather die, literally, than put this mask on my face one more night. Um, on the other hand, if we um, are, are a little preemptive, we can say, wait, instead of using this mask on the left, let's use a mouthpiece with nasal trumpets. What? that doesn't have to be pulled so tightly that it causes pressure injuries. And so the mask on the right is the one that I would recommend um, and do it from the beginning so that the person doesn't have that terrible experience that uh, promotes less than 95% compliance. What, less than 95%? No, let me say it differently. Less than 5% compliance, 95% of folks would never wear the mask on the left again, ever. Don't come near me with it, period. So special considerations in spinal cord injury, I've got them listed here. Glossopharyngeal breathing is going to be taught to anybody that is gonna be leaving the facility on a mechanical ventilator because, um, <clears throat> oh, those mechanical ventilators can fail or the electricity can fail. Uh, one or both could lead to the person's inability to be ventilated and subsequent death, unless, they learn to use glossopharyngeal breathing, that is frog breathing, that is actually very well demonstrated by this movie uh, with Christopher Reeve in Rear Window, uh, way back before the turn of the century, um, in which uh, the bottom line is somebody turns off his ventilator and he dies. And it's really, no, 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 he doesn't die. He uses glossopharyngeal breathing for the next minute and a half. Hollywood gets it right and shows how Christopher Reeve maintains his life literally, by using glossopharyngeal breathing while the ventilator is turned off. Um, and so we need to provide this to our folks. Um, we also need to provide them vaccinations, the pneumococcal vac uh, vaccine, uh, both the 23 valent and the 13 uh, covalent um, vaccines need to be administered at least a year apart from each other, and then the annual flu vaccine. Um, I, I don't think there's any other uh, I don't know, bacteria, viruses that, oh, wait, wait, yes, there is COVID now that we also have to consider for our folks with spinal cord injury. Now, as you all have heard ad nauseum, COVID um, has uh, taken our society by storm. And uh, it's also known as severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's similar actually uh, to the SARS-CoV virus of 2003 and also similar to the Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome coronavirus of 2012. It is an enveloped, non-segmental, single-stranded RNA virus with a nucleocapsid. Um, and what we know is that it is um, almost identical to the bat coronavirus, RATG13, um, and 80% uh, identical to the previous SARS uh, coronavirus of 2003. Um, it appears that bats, in fact, are the natural host of this coronavirus-19, um, and it may be transmitted from bats via unknown host to infected humans or from humans to humans. Um, I, I am assuming that you all know this, but maybe not. Uh, it most likely uses the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 to infect humans, um, and so we have these droplets 
uh, we are exposed to these droplets and subsequently we uh, develop symptoms of the virus. The most common symptoms, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Severe symptoms, troubled breathing, persistent che uh, chest pressure or pain, uh, new confusion, mental status changes, bluish lips or face. These are, these are suboptimal <laughs> indicators of respiratory status. Um, now, what about comparing this with other pandemics? Um, and so last month, Peterson put out a, um, a comparison between the other pandemics that we've recently encountered. And so looking at the, in the uh, far left column here, the SARS COVID virus uh, 19 or COVID-2 compared to the SARS coronavirus of 2002, 2003, the pandemic influenza of 1918, the pandemic influenza of 2009. <clears throat> when you make a comparison of these, basically we find the reproductive rate of our current SARS uh, or COVID-19 is more, uh, more likely to be reproduced and transmitted than other viruses. Um, that is, it's probably more contagious. Um, the mortality is skewed for those with the uh, COVID virus of 2002, as well as the COVID-19 to those individuals more than 75 years of age. Hospitalization is required less frequently for folks with COVID-19 than with COVID-2002. Um, and fewer ICU admissions, what, in COVID-19 than in COVID-2002, but more so than in 2009. The mortality rate for those under the age of 65 with COVID-19 um, is about 1% compared to 80% of those who had the 2009 flu. Um, so I, I am, am trying to put together the pieces and we still don't have all the data that we need. Um, and so we hear a lot about the 200,000 deaths associated, associated with, not necessarily caused by COVID. Um, and I'm not trying to minimize this at all, but I'm just saying we also need to take a look from a 30,000 uh, foot perspective. Um, all cause mortality in 2017 was significantly higher than what we've seen so far in 2019, 2020. Um, and um, when we talk about persons over the age of 75. Realize that currently we have 25 million people over the age of 75 in the United States with a life expectancy of 78.6 years of age. 92,000 people currently in the United States are over the age of 100. And based on data from 2018, we expect one and a half million people over the age of 75 to die in 2020 with or without COVID. So I just bring that up because I really don't know what to make of our current um, uh, pandemic. Um, nonetheless, we need to know how to manage it uh, for, for persons with spinal cord injury. And we've just had uh, a manuscript accepted to the journal of uh, the, um, oh, I can't remember, something of the emergency physicians. Uh, and basically uh, we, really have optimized management strategies for spinal cord injury using supportive care that is duoneps, postural percussion and drainage, mechanical and exhalation, and making sure that they have access to a negative uh, pressure room. Um, a recent trial, how recent was reported three days ago um, in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at uh, remdem remdesivir, um, and they showed that uh, they have shortened the course of the disease by approximately five days using remdesivir uh, compared to placebo, um, and that the mortality rate with remdesivir is about 6.7% compared to placebo of 11.4%. So it appears that remdesivir is superior to placebo. Um, there are a number of things that we continue to learn about managing this virus. We're hopeful we'll have a vaccine in the near future. Um, that said, I'm gonna move forward uh, with our discussion on spinal cord injury. Um, I only have a few minutes left, but I did want to bring up the um, use of diaphragmatic pacemaking. Um, actually, this was uh, first described by Hugh Flynn as a, uh, a way of providing CPR way back in the 1700s and 1800s. Uh, Judson and Glenn uh, had been uh, using diaphragmatic pacing in dogs uh, and uh, did their first implant into humans in 1968. Um, 
These pacemakers are actually covered under Medicare Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, reimbursement. Um, indications are for those individuals with Ondine's curse, that is central hypoventilation syndrome, organic brainstem lesions and complete cervical cord lesions, um, so long as you have a viable phrenic nerve. How do you know if it's viable? Um, you do nerve conduction studies um, and or look uh, with a, um, uh, an ultrasound to see if you've got diaphragmatic excursion as you go through there. Components of a diaphragmatic pacemaker uh, whether it goes to the phrenic nerve or from below to the motor points of the diaphragm, include a stimulator, an antenna receiver, and a radio transmitter. Um, and there's a fair amount of data, uh, again, before the turn of the century, demonstrating the efficacy of uh, diaphragmatic pacemaking in um, not just folks with spinal cord injury, but if you look at just folks with spinal cord injury, you have close to a 50% uh, success rate um, even before the turn of the century. Since that time, uh, it appears that this is uh, uh, becoming more and more favorable as we go through. And in fact, we have a um, minimally invasive surgeon here at Jackson who actually uh, does diaphragmatic pacing, um, similar to what was uh, utilized for Christopher Reeve. Um, and uh, again, includes components of an electrode placement below the diaphragm uh, into the motor points with an antenna receiver and radio transmitter. Um, the other thought is that perhaps we could reduce the diaphragmatic uh, atrophy that occurs uh, during mechanical ventilation. And so um, you remember that with uh, minimally invasive surgery, you can come in below the level of uh, uh, the diaphragm, basically blow things up so that you can look at the diaphragm and then sew in your electrodes to the motor points uh, from below the diaphragm, never having to crack the chest as they used to have to do with the phrenic nerve pacemakers. Um, and, and basically these folks are already on mechanical ventilators, don't forget that. So you can actually do this as an outpatient procedure now and, um, and then send them home same day um, with a weaning protocol uh, that allows home-based uh, conditioning um, and they simply dial in. So what they do is they turn, and this is important, turn the uh, pacemaker on before you turn the ventilator off, just, just saying, um, and, and then uh, allow for a progressively increased length of time uh, that they are being paced um, as opposed to when they're on the uh, ventilator. So the weaning protocol then is very, very similar to the weaning protocol that we advocate while they're in the ICU coming off of a ventilator. So finally, um, I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. Um, does a person with spinal cord injury sneeze effectively? And so I'm, I'm gonna ask you to work through this uh, poem with me. Through three cheese, tree, three cheese, three free fleas flew, help me. While these fleas flew, freezy breeze blew, freezy breeze made these three trees free, you're not helping me, freezy trees made these trees cheese freeze. And that's what made these three free fleas sneeze. And this was, of course, written by Theodore Geisel, who was that? None other than Dr. Seuss, yes. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. I have a number of uh, references. Um, some of are, are, are literally within the last uh, month as we've taken a look at this. I have a couple of minutes left for questions. Would be happy to uh, discuss further with you. Um, and yet that's the formal end of my lecture. Thoughts, questions, concerns? Gripes, groans, psychic moans. Wow, I must have left you out of breath. Okay, the rest of you have a great day. Don't blow this off. This is very, very important. And um, I'll see you next week uh, when I don't remember what topic I'll be speaking on, but I'm sure it, it won't be as good as this. Well, maybe it'll probably be better. So have a great day. Thanks all for your uh, participation. Much appreciated.